Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Andrew Perchuk. I'm the deputy director of the Getty Research Institute. And tonight I'm really delighted to welcome you to Imaginaries of LA, Guadalupe Rosales, and uh, Pilar Tompkins Rivas in conversation. Uh, I'm thrilled to have that we have an artist whose work I've long admired, uh, Guadalupe Rosales, and a director and curator, Pilar Tompkins Rivas, who we've worked with very closely for many years, including uh, during the last PST. Behind me, you see the Getty Research Institute, where selfishly, I wish that I was, uh, both because I long for return to normalcy and also because I miss many of you who I haven't seen in a year. But in other ways, I'm very glad that we are not at the Getty Research Institute today. Um, because of Zoom, we have over 300 people who RSVP'd for this event nationally and even internationally, which is far more than we could possibly have hosted at the Getty where we're doing this live. Also, I think that uh, I need to acknowledge that Los Angeles is historically and unfortunately still today a very segregated city with limited, especially historically, interchange between East and West and North and South. Um, so that there are many Los Angeleses. And this afternoon, we are thrilled to be able to hear Guadalupe's and Pilar's. Because we're talking about the cultural geography of Los Angeles, I think it's equally important to acknowledge that I am currently standing on the ancestral and traditional home of the Tongva and Chumash peoples. So now I'm gonna turn things over to Zana Gilbert and we'll get the program started. Welcome everybody. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. My name uh, is Zana Gilbert. I'm from the curatorial department at the Getty Research Institute. Um, and Imaginaries of LA is a series of conversations between artists and curators that explores what is at stake in the representation of LA and provides a forum for debate about the past, present and future of the city. The series is organized in conjunction with the release of the new website, 12 Sunsets, that you can see behind me. Um, this website presents a vast trove of photos from Ed Ruscha's Streets of Los Angeles archive, uh, photos taken between 1966 and 2007. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a brief back background on the project um, and how uh, this relates to the series and the event tonight. So the first of the photos from this archive were taken by Ruscha for the artist book, uh, Every Building on the Sunset Strip in 1966. And he devised a method to capture the street with what he called um, motorized photos using a camera mounted on the back of his pickup truck. And he drove back and forth on sunset, uh, capturing both sides of the street. Um, after this book was done, he continued to use the formula to re-photograph sunset and many other streets over the next six decades, uh, resulting in an incredible archive of information um, on these parts of, of Los Angeles. But the questions at the heart of this archive, uh, we felt, stood as an opportunity to converse with contemporary artists who've engaged the, with the city in their work. And at the same time, the archive provokes questions about what it means to create a photographic archive of LA, uh, of the urban landscape, who has agency in this, and what stories are highlighted or buried. Um, this series of events was provoked by the global pandemic and reckoning with the inequities of our cities. We wanted to consider the histories and futures of LA and to engage with imaginaries of the city beyond its dominant representation. In our last conversation in the series uh, with Edgar Arsenault and Julian Meyer-Szupinska, we talked about the city having what Mike Davis has described as a conspiracy of silence about its histories. 
artists often step in to intervene in the silence and to spin stories that differ, as Arsenault put it, from the conventions of storytelling that are writ large over the city and projected from it uh, in the form of global entertainment. So with that, uh, it's my deep pleasure to welcome Guadalupe Rosales and Pilar Tompkins Rivas. Guadalupe is an artist um, based in LA. Uh, she's an archivist and educator and founder of the community generated archival projects Veteranes and Rukas and Map Points on Instagram. Her work centers on the creation of immersive and sensorial spaces to activate memory and evoke a collective experience uh, and embodiment. Pilar Tompkins Rivas is Chief Curator and Deputy Director of Curatorial and Collections at the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Previously, she was chief curator and director at the Vincent Price Art Museum, where she curated an exhibition of Guadalupe's work in 2018. So now I'm going to invite Pilar and Guadalupe to begin their conversation, and I'll rejoin them at the end for the Q&A. Uh, we invite you to contribute your questions uh, in the Q&A box throughout the talk, uh, and we'll get to them at the end. So thank you, uh, Pilar and Guadalupe. Hello, and, and thank you so much, Zana, and, uh, and thank you, Andrew, um, as well as Chelsea and the GRI team uh, for hosting this conversation. It's a real pleasure to um, participate in the series and to be in dialogue with Guadalupe, an artist who I've known for many years now and have had the pleasure of working with in the past. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to my good friend and colleague, Rita Gonzalez, who was first asked to host this conversation, but was unable to join us today. And uh, um, she and I have both share in our admiration of Lupe's work. And so I'm just delighted to be here with you. I'm going to begin uh, to screen share images and uh, we can take it from, from there. Lupe, do you want to um, chime in? <laughs> yeah, hi, Pilar. So I'm, you know, we've been uh, uh, preparing for this for this conversation, and um, you know, it's also a conversation that's always evolving. You know, I've, I've, I met Pilar, uh, I would say maybe 2015 when I first moved to to LA, and um, and it's been an honor to work with you, Pilar. So thank you for being part of this conversation. Um, so I guess I would, how I wanted to begin this, this, this talk is just to give you all a, my own, uh, I guess, like personal narrative, you know, like my, my history with, with Los Angeles. And um, I wanted to begin with sharing a personal photo of myself as a teenager. Um, and this is a this is myself, my sister, and we are at a backyard party in City Terrace. I believe it's either 1995 or 1996. So, um, you know, briefly, my sister and I are only 10 months apart from each other. You know, so she and I did a lot of things together. She was a person that I would go out with. I went to high school with her. I ditched school with her. You know, we uh, shared personal things with each other, um, which also meant that we were there for each other, even through like the most difficult um, times in our lives. You know, when we talk about growing up in East LA, there's a lot of fond memories, but there's also, you know, I grew up in the 90s and this was, uh, you know, violence, I would say gang and state violence was at, at its peak at that time. Um, at the same time, you know, violence was almost normalized. So it wasn't so much about, um, you know, I guess like what something I was thinking about was we just we just felt like that's what it was, you know. Um, when I think back of that time, as a teenager, I I actually never really thought like, oh, I could live a, a better life because this is what it is, you know. Um, 
so it wasn't until I left LA, my cousin, you know, I, I've experienced a lot of violence in my life, but it wasn't until 1996 when my cousin passed away. He was actually killed by a rival gang in, in East LA. And that affected my whole family, myself included. And um, I've been thinking a lot about this, not so much about grief, but also about, um, I want to say that like, because of the, the grief, there was also, that was also my first experience with collective healing. You know, like when we think, when we talk about collective healing, it's um, actually my own experience with that was like, I had my friends come to my home you know, and share stories about my cousin and just talk endlessly um, on my porch till the sun came out, you know, and that's, that's what it was, you know, like I think uh, our, my friends were also part of family. Um, so I guess we can go back to, we can go to the next slide, Delar. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to kind of back sure. up one second and just kind of take a look at that picture. You're growing up in Los Angeles in, in the 90s. And um, a lot of the work that you have done is around kind of documenting and archiving and working in a collective way to aggregate images of your personal experiences, those of your friends and family members, but other people that shared similar life experiences that you might not nece necessarily know. But um, as you kind of pull back from that, mm -hmm. it does seem like you know, these images really speak to how you're navigating the city, how this is a moment in time of, of a way in which people interacted in Los Angeles. And I wonder just for the, you know, for a little bit of context, if you could also um, speak a little bit to what this scene was like, which you've talked a lot about being involved in party crews, and I'm not sure that everyone on the call today will know what those are and what this scene was all about and what, what it meant to kind of navigate that space um, of the city, um, how you engaged in placemaking as a young person in LA. And then since you moved away from Los Angeles to New York, following a series of events that you just talked about, when you came back to the city, how did that, how did, how did, how did that feel? Did you feel like an outsider in some ways or were you able to have some distance from this? So I know yeah. that to ask at once, but. <laughs> no, maybe we can like, you can come back to one of these, you know, to some of these questions, but even when you, when you were talking about what it was like to, to socialize, to organize, to be part of party crews and I'll explain what that what that was like. Um, but first I wanted to mention that uh, you know East LA, LA, or I would say the east side of LA was my world, you know, like I I, you know, like these terms marginalized and underrepresented, misrepresented. This is all, these are all like um, I would say words that I've learned uh, once I left LA and came back and I started doing the, these, this, this, this work with the archive. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that in a, in a, in a second, but um, a party crew was almost like an alternative or um, a different way of socializing in, in LA. You know, uh, kids were, were organizing underground parties, um, DIY parties, which meant if our parents weren't home, we would use the backyard, you know, all over LA. Uh, we would use abandoned uh, buildings in downtown LA, Vernon, Boyle Heights. And we had our own DJs. We had our own people who would design the, the flyers. Um, and this was all, I guess, like self-organized, you know? And the crews were, I mean, there were hundreds of party crews, female party crews and, and, and male party crews. Um, and each party crew had a name that we chose collectively, each crew, each crew that felt, I would say maybe like empowering, you know? It could have been like, my party crew was East LA's Aztec Nation, 
there were other party crews like East LA's Madness, but also there were also there were there were female party crews that were very sexual, you know, sexualized, uh, you know, uh, maybe like Midnight Pleasure or you know, there's like hundreds that I can't really think of right now. But and this was really important, you know, like when I left LA and then I started looking or I, I would say maybe doing research on a community that I'm deeply rooted in, you know, just to have some sort of understanding or material that I can reflect back on. This is when I lived in New York, you know, I, I saw a lot of material that it was offered like the male perspective and it was really focused on gang culture. And to me, that was really, you know, I almost felt like there was like this, this urgency for me to speak on the complexities of growing up in, I guess, you know, marginalized communities or um, I would say like uh, communities where children of immigrants live in, you know, or even immigrants. Um, so I think it was really important for me to talk about that, you know, because of these stereotypes that I was looking at, that I was reading about on, on, on the internet. And, and so when you were, let's say, like doing that research um, and using online tools, uh, how did that prompt you to think about Los Angeles, even from a distance of Google Maps? Or, you know, did, did that become like, a, a, an, an intermediary way of thinking about place, thinking about Los Angeles, I mean, through the lens of online platforms. And, and maybe if, it, if it's okay, we could kind of go into talking about um, how, that, how that evolved into using social media as um, a means of creating another way of documenting so these social experiences and, and really essentially creating an archive with veteranas and drucas of images of Chicanas and Latinas in the 90s, which as you say, you know, when you would, I think you could probably Google today, like a Latino and just come up with, you know, thug imagery or um, uh, something like that. I mean, that's probably like the first most Googleable image I haven't tried it in a while, but <laughs> I've tried it in the past. <laughs> Um, but you have a, a just, a, you're essentially filling a, a void of images of young Latinas and Chicanas um, from this period, which, you know, didn't have a digital footprint or, mm -hmm. or a, a, um, this kind of, a, of an aggregate, if you will, to tell the story in, in, uh, from your perspective and in, and also here you can see, you know, that through the, um, the text that would accompany the post, you're also fielding other people's comments about their image, their own images and their experiences. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this project, but also what the process, what this project has meant to kind of reframe this history and and what types of things you know happen within this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. After doing multiple research or just a lot of research online, uh, I know I was looking, I want to say that like when I was using the internet, I myself didn't, didn't even know what to type, you know, like how do I even dis describe my own experience growing up, growing up in Los Angeles? And what I realized was that I actually wanted to hear and read stories, you know, like I was really interested in storytelling because that was as personal as something that, you know, as, as personal as someone can get. And also that felt like more, you know, it, was, it, gave, it gave me a, a sense of I'm being seen or, or I can tell you a story and, I, and, and you understand, you know, like I wanted that, like that, like almost like mirror um, experience with another person, you know? And I felt like photography or images are a way of telling a story, but also, um, you know, I feel like people that don't understand what's happening in the photograph, the best thing to do is to, to bring us back to that place, right? For, so for example, this image here, or um, let's go back to this one, yeah. So 
you know, my process when I when I post an, a photo, it's um, I engage with the person that submits the, the photograph, you know, and I ask them, so can you can you share a memory with us? Like, what is it that you want to tell me about this photograph? Where was this photo taken? Um, and then this is how the caption gets developed, uh, you know, and like the, something that's interesting about this photograph was that when I posted this image with the caption, there were a lot of people that were really excited to see a different understanding and a different like of, of Hollywood Boulevard, you know, and like you have like these like Chicanos walking on Whittier Boulevard, leaving a party, you know, a ditching party. And the conversations were about that, you know, and also uh, about the women, the young women walking with pride you know, and I forget what the other part of the, of the question you had, but would you, if you can remind me. Um, yeah, I guess I was just thinking about, you know, um, I mean, what this may, I'll maybe just expand on it a little bit. Um, and this draws back to what you, I think you were saying sort of at the opening, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking too about um, a, a perpetual question of who gets to, be the storyteller who gets to tell these stories, um, and and what happens, you know, within this site through the storytelling. I mean, I know that you have also mentioned to me in the past about um, trauma and and how that um, is something that can be processed. You mentioned kind of collective processing in a way of your experiences in your youth in the city. Um, that happens here virtually with people that you may or may not know personally. But, um, you know, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that. And even in some cases, does this function like a kind of virtual and archival memorial of sorts? Yeah, people have described it as this like hybrid split, uh, space where people get to honor, celebrate, and also use this platform as an altar, you know? Um, for example, before I share this photo that, that you all see here, um, this post here, I had shared a photo of a, of a friend of mine who I went to high school with. Um, when I was living in New York, and I guess I, I, I wanna like, go back a little, you know, I left, I left me LA in 2000 and I lived there for 15 years. And this is where I started looking at Los Angeles through the internet. And through that process, um, I also found out a lot, I, a lot of friends were dying in the hands of the police or that were also in prison, you know? And I had also used the, you know, the LA times to, it got, to, it got to that level where I started Google searching friends just to make sure that they were still alive, you know, and okay. And unfortunately, I found some information that was really hard, you know, like, for example, a, a friend of mine who had been killed by the Montebello police in 1999 and 98, I believe. Um, and I posted that, a, photo, a photograph of him. And... I shared my own like story, you know, what I remember of him and about police brutality. And after that fo photograph, others started submitting photos like this one that you see here of Joseph. This picture was, was shared by Joseph's sister and she wanted to make this public, you know, to talk about her grief to talk about the injustice. And um, something that I mentioned to you, Pilar, was that, you know, that the comments, uh, the comments section are just as important because then there's some sort of uh, dialogue um, that needs to happen, you know? So this platform has become a, 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 a space for that as well. I wanna um, also, you know, share all the images on our PowerPoint, but before moving on, I, I wanted to also just kind of touch on this idea of the 
the other things that you're documenting that might not just be images of people, but parts mm -hmm. of the city, um, portraits of the city in some ways. And I wonder if you could, you know, say, talk a little bit about th this image, which this, uh, you know, phone booth, but um, it says a lot. And I wonder what you might share about this image, for example, or why it's important to you. So this is, uh, this is a payphone across the street from my old house. On, on Leonard and Woodard Boulevard, where I used to live as a teenager. And this was a hangout spot as well back, back, in, back in the day. And, um, you know, there's also like a funny story where my mom, she's like, I felt like she kind of like lost control of her kids. And in order to, for her to like punish us, she would lock, she would like disconnect the landline, her phone from the house and lock it in her closet. And, you know, and back in the day we had like our beepers, so we couldn't actually <laughs> return calls or people couldn't call us back in the house. And we just be made this phone like our, our, our hangout spot because of that reason, which also meant that we were at this, you know, at, at this location 24 seven, you know, past midnight um, and which, we also, you know, like because of that, we also got to experience a lot of things, you know, like um, my sister was, you know, like this guy like pulled a gun on her while she was on the phone, you know, a friend of mine um, was shot, you know, and, 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 these, and like even when I when I heard about that story, you know, of someone that, you know, like my friend getting shot at this payphone, it was when I posted this photo. And I don't know if you guys can see, but there's a there's a hole on top, right on top of the phone where it says it's black and it's just broken. So someone told me that that was a bullet that that shattered the phone. And so anyway, I took this photo. I want to say uh, maybe three years ago, and it still functions. You know, like it's the same phone. I picked it up. It's you know I can make phone calls. So I started to kind of see these sites like relics, you know, or almost like um, like scars in the city. That's co keep collecting memory, keep collecting trauma, keep collecting all these experiences that that our body that our bodies can do as well. I want to talk a little bit on that point. I mean, it's almost like a convergence of you know physical archive with the digital representation of those things and. Um, and your project Veteranos and Rucas began as an Instagram uh, site um, and grew into so much more and also has expanded as people have um, contacted you and they want to send you things and it creates, and you had your own materials, I, I presume, but um, it also has sort of bled into a physical archive that now you are a personal custodian of this material. Yeah, and, and I wanna mention that when I started with the Nanas and Rukas in 2015, I wasn't calling it archive. I didn't even know, I didn't even know about that word to be honest with you, you know? I later on learned that what I was doing was archiving and collecting and, you know, and I think that in the description in, in I guess like on the page, I said something like go down memory lane with me <laughs> or something like that, or like hood life, because I didn't know how to talk about it. And that's how much it's also evolved, which brings us back to these um, physical archives, right? Like as these two pages continue to grow, people are now taking out their own archives their physical archives are going to their storage units or going to their garage under their beds and thinking like, I have similar photographs as these as the ones posted. I have these magazines that I used to collect as a teenager. And, and I've been lucky enough to, or, you know, to, for people to trust me to, to donate these materials. So now I'm also collecting physical materials and you know so that I house in my studio that I taken on this responsibility of digitizing hundreds of magazines thousands of flyers even clothing 
So the archive that started as a digital archive is now becoming a physical archive. So, and these are also like my own photographs that I've been, that I, my, actually my mom kept for, you know, for years, you know, cause I left to out to New York and I, I didn't, I only brought a few photos with me in like two magazines and I come back and my mom said to say, you know, she's like, Hey, you left the box with like love letters and photographs of, of your friends. So these are all um, quick examples of, you know, like my own collection. Um, I wanted, wondered if you, if in these materials, you might also talk a little bit about the kind of DIY quality of this and who was who was doing this type of production at that time. Mm -hmm. That really is an interesting aspect to this as well. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that like these these magazines weren't perfectly made. You know, we had, this is like another thing that teenagers were producing. You know, um, the text in these magazines, especially Street Beat magazine, were writers that were writing for their yearbooks in high school. Um, these photographs were taken by, for example, someone that was taking a photo class in high school and had access to a camera. Um, so it was like that style, you know, like Street Beat magazine, Subculture magazine, and a bunch of other magazines that I, I, uh, have in, in, in my collection are all produced by youth. And, you know, I, I also want to say that the founder for Street Beat Magazine was with Marty Bean. And I want to, um, I haven't been able to get in touch with him, but I think it's really important what he did to start, you know, Street Beat Magazine, because if it wasn't for that, we would have like pretty much nothing <laughs> right now, you know? So, yeah, so that's the, that's the, that's the backstory of these magazines. Um, that's an interesting segue, you know, thinking about just people picking up cameras and documenting the scene that they're living in in the city, what their reality, what their experience is like, um, who their friends are, what they do, and and you've also um, you have um, your art practice encompasses a lot of different types of work. And I wanted to speak a little bit about recent photography that you've been doing and show some images and see if you can uh, speak to some of these, um, these, these photographs. Yeah. Um, so the, the next photographs that we're gonna show are images that I've been taking since I moved back to LA. This photograph here is literally across the street. This is what I saw every day. You know, my house is on the other side. And I always thought of this image every time I thought about my experience in LA, you know? And when I went back in, I wanna say this was in 20, I, I came back in 26, 2015, 2016, and this photo was taken in 2018. And um, when I went back to this neighborhood, to this area, I felt like I had stepped back into the 90s because it felt the same, you know, like a, a lot, nothing actually had changed. You know, the same color on the walls. Um, <clears throat> you can see the shoes hanging from the cable wires in the alley. That green light that you see across the sky, that's a helicopter, you know? So I've been, um, the way I, I see these, these, you know, I guess like my art practice or photography is that, uh, in some ways it has allowed me to work through, through maybe questions that I have, a better understanding of my upbringings or even like uh, closure or, or healing from trauma. So that's, that's how I understand this work. Should we talk about these next two images? Yes. Mm -hmm. So briefly, um, this is actually, one of the first photographs, it's it's blurry, um, it's past midnight, this is in Ramona Gardens. I didn't bring a tripod with me. Um, this is actually where my, my cousin was killed. And it was my first time just going there, you know, feeling unsafe, being, um, revisiting trauma, as I said. And I took these photos not knowing what I have captured. 
um, I developed develop these photographs and I when I when I saw these these images I, I can feel my nervousness you know so this was my first attempt and I almost feel like these photographs are ongoing because I kept going back so we can go to the next photo so this was um, in 2019 the black and white photo was probably 2016 or so so this was finally, you know, I bring my tripod, I'm, I feel a little bit more comfortable, I, I take the shot, but still far, you know, like the lines that you guys see is the fence, you know, so I, I'm almost like taking baby steps closer and closer and closer to the site where, where he was murdered. And this was, um, was it last year? It's like time flies. I don't even know. Like <laughs> time feels so like like a time warp. But when you know when I moved back to LA, I always had this this desire to go to go back to the location. You know, this is the same location at the same time that he had been killed. So this is my first the first time that I actually go at eleven thirty on December 21st, and I take these shots. And this is last year, December 21st. And so that's the kind of, it's interesting, you know, just the time lapse of, from the incident, the trauma that it created in, within you and the family, of course, and then how long it has taken to go back to that site of trauma over time and how you did it incrementally um, it seems is reflected in the in, in those images as part of the, the process it's a somewhat of a time capsule in that respect um, but i i wondered if you could also talk about this next suite of images and and what these types of 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 vistas on the city of los angeles you know, mean. I'm thinking about, of course, you know, Roche's series and how how different or similar that could be to these types of images. Could you talk a little bit about this, about these and what this place is? Yeah, so unlike Roche's work, you know, I feel like these, specifically these two photographs, it's the same location. Um, it's funny because a lot of we had nicknames for these 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 locations, right? Like we used to call them the shortcut. <laughs> Some people will call them the butt crack of East LA. Um, but these are all almost like little hidden treasures of the neighborhood. You know, like some people that I guess I you know like I would say like if you know you know that kind of thing. You know, it's not Sunset Boulevard. You know, so um, but a lot of people when I posted these photographs they recognize them right away you know and um like my experience or well, my personal relationship to to this location is where you know how we got to our friend's house in the neighborhood how we run from the police you know so and also it felt unsafe sometimes um and i forget what i was going to say about you know like i think for me I am a type of person that likes to share stories that keeps that likes to talk about it, but I also have relatives, you know, even like myself for a long time, I didn't share my story. You know, like I go to, uh, to New York and I don't want to talk about my experience in LA. So I almost feel like this kind of work has allowed me to do that in some sense, you know, like keep revisiting these locations, keep thinking about it. Um, it almost feels to me that that's 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 like a form of healing for myself. Do you want to talk about? Um, oh about yeah, I'll, I can talk about this briefly. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, my high school actually, and I went back last year, and it looked completely different. You know, like when I went there, that fence didn't exist. You know, we it felt like a school, and I go back. And I'm, I, it feels more like a, like a prison. So I started to think about that relationship with institutions, you know, how, how we get introduced to, to, you know, like 
okay, well, like uh, you went to a school that looks like a prison, you know, it's not too far off from a prison. So I don't know, it just made me think about that, you know? So I guess I'm also like documenting the changes in the city. Yeah. Um, before we move on from this image, my husband would be upset if I didn't say go Spartans since he went to the same. Place. Yes. <laughs> but I'm um, just going to move briefly through these other two images, which are also, I think, speak to what you're talking about of documenting the city from your vantage point, from your positionality and, um, and, and thinking about. I know you mentioned that you may also be developing new work around documenting Whittier Boulevard, which is, um, I think in the history of Los Angeles equally as significant as Sunset Boulevard, but tells a different, has a different story to tell. But I, I wanna make sure we have time to think sure. uh, through as well around how this comes to like look in the exhibition space and how these many different you know, parts of the archive inform um, your practice and and what that looks like in um, in an exhibition setting and this was we've got a few images here from a couple different shows so I don't know if you want to speak to them specifically or just more generally about how your work manifests across different media and um, and how you think about the way that you create an immersive space if you will yeah so this is um, a show at the Vincent Price that, that Pilar curated. Um, and it was, you know, it was such a great, great experience to work on this show because it was my first solo show. And it was also my first solo show here in LA, which also meant that I, I got to work really closely with my sister. I got to work really closely with a lot of women who I met through Instagram, a lot of women who I reconnected with, who were that, I, you know, I was friends with in high school, who I, I partied with. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, this, this, this space itself, I was thinking a lot about activating memory, activating, it was like a sensorial space, a collective sensorial space, you know? I wanted people to come and feel, um, for example, like the music that was in, there was sound in this, in this room, but it wasn't like I was playing music that, you know, that like we can recognize, you know? Like for example, like this is that song or this song, it was more about what does it feel like on our bodies, like the vibration. And one thing that I mentioned to Pilar was that I was really interested in working with how our bodies respond, especially before like this advanced technology that we have now, you know, like now we have GPS, we look at our phones, we know where to go. And the music that was playing in this room was inspired. Or I was really like thinking about what it, what it felt like to go to a party and you hear from far away. And that's, that's what you follow, you know, like you're like, okay, I can hear the music down the block. That's where the party must be. So it was, it was so much about taking us to, to a time and place. I'm going to move um, through some of the images so we can just see these other two shows and just see, you know, how um, these pedestals too, which I think are very interesting are not only a, a, a containment device for some actual physical archival material, but also become something that can be engaged with through um, performance and collaboration. And then also look very much like memorials as well, which seems to be a recurrent idea. Um, and, I, and I know we're getting close to the end um, of our time, so yeah. I just wanted to maybe show these additional ones and so people can get a sense of, of your different display strategies, which I think are also really important within your work um, and how people can see through kind of multiple images, multiple archival materials at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and then how that also leads into image making that also picks up from different iconographies embedded within all these different points in the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so briefly, I know we have a few more minutes, um, but I just wanted to 
talk about the, the, my 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 uh, practice as a whole, right? Um, that you know, the work that I put in exhibitions is um, I want to treat it as like a, a reflection of who I am, but also of my community of Los Angeles. You know, like I would I'd say that 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 is my biggest in inspiration um, from selecting materials to to even color, all that stuff. And even like um, if we go back, Pilar, to the photo of, yeah, like these here, that's good. Uh, that is an example of how, you know, because I think about how, how, how am I going to make this physical archive accessible to an audience? And when I think about archives in other like more traditional institutions, you know, it's it's almost like very clinical, like there's, you can only see one side sometimes. So here, um, what I did was I display some of my personal photographs and those that you saw the, the earlier with the back, with the writings on the back, their wallet size photographs. And if we can go to the next image, I think it's a, a close up. Sorry, this one? The next one, that one. So what I did is that I, I placed a mirror on the floor and the archive is sandwiched between two panes of glass and they're flipped. You know, there's some that are they that are where the back's facing up, facing up. And I really wanted to display, you know, like this, this, like the, the intimacy of these archives, the writing, but also have access to looking at these images through the mirror. Um, I, I, they were kind enough to let me know we can go on a little bit longer. So, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a few more minutes to keep, if you want to jump back into any, any, um, any other image, I, I did want to talk a little bit, you know, just about if we could, um, you know, about something like this, where there are so many things happening at once. Um, could you kind of speak to, to why, why is it important to, you know, have people engage with, your archives that then become sculptural, that then become performative, that then also function in relationship to a blow up of your photography. And, you know, you have the lighting in a very specialized manner. What is this all? How does that, you know, why is that essential for you? So um, there are various reasons why I, I started making these these pedestals slash portals uh, and I you know it's almost like this ongoing series that I have the first two were at the Vincent Price and so far I've made I'm on my fourth one and they're always different um my the reason you know like I, I why I started making these was because of what I said earlier about the archive how to display the archive you know when you think about display cases, they're usually white and just very basic, you know? And I really wanted like to engage the audience in a more personal, creative way. And that's how the, these were developed. The other reason was because um, I was thinking a lot about, about um, the club scene, you know, socializing and activating these archives, activating these spaces in that way, you know, think about our bodies as archives. And um, I also feel like, you know, the idea behind these, these sculptures are also evolving, you know. Um, I also think about who I'm inviting, you know. Um, I tend to invite people who, who are very close to me, um, who I've met in, in different times in my, in my life. I've had Mariana Valencia, who was one of my closest friends. She, she's a dancer, lives in New York. Uh, Rafa, uh, Rafa Esparza, Gabriel Rivera. And I think it's important to bring different bodies, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, that's the story with that. Um. That's great. I, I, I have one kind of open ended question that actually mm -hmm. relates more to, you know, specific, more specifically to this series, which is really, you know, my question to you is, how does the LA exist in the imaginary? 
Okay, I was thinking about this. <laughs> it's so funny because I was like talking to myself about this today. And some, you know, er earlier on, I was talking about growing up in LA as a teenager and, you know, thinking back to that time, I felt like that's all we had. You know, like this is this is just what it is, you know? And what the work has taught me, the archive, these conversations, my practice, is that when we start to ask questions, when we when we start to reframe histories, our own histories, that impacts the way we think about the future, right? How we can reimagine a better future. You know, now because we're having these more open conversations, we start to understand ourselves differently, like possibilities, you know? And that's that's my answer to that. Like, I think um, I'm really interested in, in collect collectively reimagining a better future for us. I, I, I think that's really beautiful. And I, and I think that, you know, it underscores the notion of collectivity that is omnipresent in your work. That this is, you know, that, that is something that seems to be, you know, present everywhere that, um, that even going back to how you began with veteranes and drukas, there's the process of collectivity, but before that you are thinking, you know, or your work is embedded in your collective experiences and your youth and um, group experiences that are part of a broader slice of life of youth culture in LA. And here even, you know, in this work, it's, you know, you work collaboratively oftentimes with um, artists that, you know, that, that have a different, very different practices, but similar kind of vernacular, if you will. And, um, and that's really, I think, so beautifully put that it's, you know, really about thinking of a better future. Doing yeah, I think it's also like even these conversations, I know we have to wrap it up, but mm -hmm. because of that, there's also empowerment, you know, when we share stories. Yeah. Well, um, Zana, shall we end there? Mm -hmm. Have Zana come back? Okay, I'm reappearing. Thank you both so much. Um, Thank you. I feel like you were even just beginning to touch on so many things and it's never enough time um but i came out so so beautifully all of these questions of body and like your kind of creation of place and uh, space through your work that's you know so intimate and i mean as someone's already mentioned in the the q a that there's just such a different approach um you know to what we see in ruche which is about being objective and distanced and your work is, um, you know, so embedded in this kind of collective work and bringing the body into the image, even though you don't see the body always, but um, there's a very like um, close perspective, like some of the photographs that you, sh you showed um, that are kind of like snapshots, but you're, you feel like you're there in the space, like, and, and almost like, you know, you might be, um, sort of turning around and walking in the other direction at any moment. So I feel like there's this real kind of placing um, and Guadalupe eye view on, on everything. Um, I wanted to ask you because you, you've moved on um, from it, but I think it would be really amazing to talk about it a little bit. Um, Pilar, you brought up Whittier Boulevard and this work that um, Guadalupe is working on, as well as like the history of um, people who have uh, made work in that uh, on that street and um, thinking about Asco and George Rodriguez. So do you want to um, go there first of all and then we'll start um, we'll start uh, answering some of the questions because we already have seven in the in the box. Sorry so um, Santa is that can you tell me more about the question? I didn't catch that. Oh I was just saying um, can we talk a little bit about Whittier Boulevard? Uh, and, you know, Pilar as well, I'm sure you have like a perspective on how other artists have uh, worked in that street and, and represented that space, but um, that Guadalupe, you have some, uh, an ongoing project um, on, uh, on Whittier. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny because when we think about Whittier Boulevard, we think about the arch, right? Like the one, the big sign, like people know that. But Whittier Boulevard starts where the bridge is being rebuilt on 6th Street all the way past Pico Rivera, you know? And when I first started doing, you know, the digital archives, again, you know, my sister and I would talk about our own memories on Whittier Boulevard. And, and we, but we were talking about Atlantic Boulevard and going east. <clears throat> and even with the work, you know, like when I post photographs and I talk about <clears throat> my experience on Whittier, uh, on Instagram, it's really, I feel really like, connected to those who, who um, are familiar with certain like locations that are, that can be like unknown to others, you know? And I think about like, yeah, like Whittier Boulevard deserves to be documented in a beautiful way. And, and I almost feel like a lot, of pe a lot of people have done this, you know, and I wanna also like, not like, discredit that, you know, like I think a lot of, you know, for example, Asco made performances, you know, and I want to like show respect to those people, to like everyone else before me that have been documenting in their own way through performance, through video, through photographs, you know. Um, and I also feel like there's room to keep doing that, that kind of, you know, job or project. And, and, and I feel like I have been doing that, um, since I came back, you know, so. I wanted to touch on some one thing that you said, Lupe, that I thought was so interesting is that it's, you know, you're looking east down Whittier Boulevard, not looking west. And I think a lot of times when we think about Los Angeles or people don't necessarily, they may, if you're downtown, a lot of people are looking west. They're not downtown and looking east. But if you're, you know, if you're, Chicano, Latinx, you know, you may only be living your life in the east part of the city and always looking east or further east. And, and I, th I think there's a kind of implicit like uh, narrative about orientation, how you orient yourself in the city. And when I worked at the Vincent Price Art Museum at East Los Angeles College, I would explain to people as well that there are multiple centers in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So I think people have a tendency to feel like, oh, it's got to be over here or it's got to be over there but um you know we're we're a city that it, that exists with these um multiplicities of core central areas where so much history and culture has unfolded and Whittier Boulevard is one of those sites and I encourage uh, anyone listening to go listen to the Midnighters let's take a trip down Whittier Boulevard <laughs> 1965 it is um associated with the history of Chicano rock and roll it's associated with the Chicano moratorium in 1970, you know, major protests against um, the deaths of uh, disproportionate deaths of Chicanos on the front lines of the Vietnam uh, War. And certainly, you know, Osco's work, George Rodriguez's work are tied to those protests and to the uh, Chicano art movement, which is intrinsically tied to the civil uh, Chicano um, civil rights movement. So all that's intertwined. Um, uh, and it's a site of cruising, you know, uh, historically a site of cruising, so also a site of pleasure and leisure and centrality and, you know, and, and congregation, so, um, and community. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you can, what you will, what you will do, Lupe, with. Thank that. you. Yeah, actually, there's a, there's a photo that we briefly shared in our, our PowerPoint presentation of a couple who met on Whittier Boulevard, and they shared their story, you know, standing on Whittier, in and out burgers, and this is cruising, you know, like they're both cruising. The guy calls the girl. The girl makes a U-turn on, on their cars, like five girls in a Honda, a Honda Accord. And that's how we met, you know, that's, that's how people hooked up. And they've been together since, you know, this is like the 90s. And it was just so beautiful to read something that I'm familiar with and thousands of other people are as well. Well, uh, let's go to some of the questions they're mounting up. Um, so from uh, Miguel de Baca, and um, he says, uh, I love the handwriting of the note. So this is in response to one of the earlier slides um, of the note in the lower right. 
I remember that handwriting. Um, I remember that handwriting. Lots of my cousins and friends tried to emulate that style of writing. I was wondering the extent to which thinking about typography and hand styling goes into your work, its own style and its documentary function. So they want to know, I'm sorry, they want to know how that goes into, go ahead. Yeah, what, uh, what's your interest in typography and hand styling? Um, you know, I think like, um, so I'm doing a lot of work right now, you know, with these like sculptures that I'm making that I'm currently producing. And I've, I'm doing a lot of engraving on glass or plexiglass that is very, very similar to this like script writing that also feels like a tattoo, you know, because now it's like I'm using a, a Dremel, but I also like, I'm very familiar with that movement. And I'm, I'm, I feel like um, it's still part of who I am. It's still in my work. You know, but now it's like in 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 my uh, in my I guess my art practice, and you know, it's also it's funny because I was thinking about this, right? Like the script and the writing and the notes and all that stuff, and then we think about social media. You know how that is also a different form of that. You know, like the notes and. Um, I was actually going to post a photograph yesterday of it's a photo with writing carved on the actual photo, like on the, uh, and, and then um, I remember we used to wet it a little bit and carve it and then the, the, the writing would turn into this like glowing yellow because it's like you're like scratching off the paint. So it was another way of, you know, um, expressing ourselves or writing names of the people and I almost feel like this is how we tag people on Instagram now <laughs> you know it's the same thing so that's my response to that you know like I, I feel like um I never really had a, a writing like beautiful writing like that but my sisters always you know they had like the beautiful script um I think I'm getting better with like you know, scribing on, on glass. So we'll see. I had a, um, a sort of follow up question to that just because it's related to language, but I noticed that some of your titles have like really beautiful kind of poetic cadences about them. And I wondered, like, what's your process of coming up with titles? Are you talking about titles of my work or titles on the Instagram? <laughs> uh, well, both maybe, but. Um, yeah, titles of, of the work for sure. Um, I was thinking like exhibitions. Of, yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So last year, no, 2019, 2000, I had a, a solo show in Mexico. And it was, I was thinking about that time in between sunrise and I want to say like it's like, uh, like the morning dew, right? Mm -hmm. And my relationship to that is when I will get home from a party or when I was out with friends as a teenager and I will get home and everyone's asleep, you know, like the streets are quiet, LA's quiet. And it feels like this is like, you know, it's, this is my world right now. Like no one's around, I feel free. And I kept thinking about that. So when I, that's how I came up with that title, but I had to translate it in Spanish, you know? So that was a whole other like conversation with the curator. Okay, how do I say this? That has the same impact with what I'm imagining, what, you know, like the same feeling. So it's all like through, yeah, it's the same way. Like, like what, I, what I feel in my body, you know, how I describe a moment in time. And that title poet. must have been a wake dream. That was the title. Yes, well, the other one, but then I used it in Spanish for Mexico and I had to translate that in Spanish. It was El Rocio, I forget. It's like a long... Sobre las madrugadas. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, the Jew on the Endless Dawn, it was translated as. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so it started from the, uh, the one that you mentioned, Endless Nights. But then it was like, okay, well, what's what's like the continuation of that? So it's almost like they all they're all kind of connected in some way or another. 
Um, so that's my process with titles. <laughs> Thanks. So you're a poet. Yeah. Um, okay. Another question. Um, unlike this is from uh, Idure Alonso. Unlike the work of Ruscha, so systematic and cold, Lupe's work is deeply personal, including her work as an archivist. Everything has a story attached to it, um, and it's easy to find a connection. I think it's quite interesting how both the archive and her own practice intersects. Could, could you talk about that more in depth? Say that again. So she wants to know how your, um, the building of your archive intersects with your, with your artistic practice. Um, are they like decipherable as different things or are they completely intertwined? I feel like they can be their own separate thing. But I also know that, you know, they can speak to each other and, you know, my practice in my studio informs or it's being informed by the archive. I also want to say that, like, this is my first time ever having a studio. I've only had a studio for a year. But before that, the archive was in my apartment. I would wake up and look at it. It was like completely immersed in it. You know, I was, I talked to people all the time about, about, you know, we share memory, memories, the stories. So yeah, I guess like both are being influenced by one another. And I also wanted to mention that when I started uh, Veteranas and Brucas, I was reading a lot of poetry, specifically uh, Citizen, that book by Clara Reimkind. And that was my first introduction to thinking about, or I want to say even like Callan, um, what's her name, um, Al, um, Audre Lorde, you know, poetry is not a luxury. And I started to understand that art is my voice to talk about things that could be very difficult to talk about, you know? So maybe that's like a long answer to that question. And then, so yeah, it's like they both inform each other or influence each other. Okay, another question from um, Julian Myers Shupinska, formerly, uh, formerly was the panelist for the last Imaginaries of LA. Uh, he says, thanks Guadalupe and Pilar for the fascinating conversation. Guadalupe, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the artists or photographers that interested you as you developed your practice. What body of images were you hoping to contribute to or intervene in? Photographers? Um, I want to say that, please forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, but Jamal, Jamal Jabaz, I think, is that how you pronounce it? Can mm -hmm. someone look it up? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, you know, he's been documenting uh, communities and people in New York, and these photographs feel very, very personal. Um, and when I saw these photographs, I felt like he was like documenting um, almost like non-performing, performing, like people, like just like snapshots of people, you know? And I wanna say he is someone that I truly respect. Um, Dina Lawson too. I'm actually gonna be visiting her class uh, next month. And yeah, I think that even like, they're, they're not necessarily famous, but I want to say like our families, right? Like the way we collected our photo, like our taking, you know, like my mom with her, this is before the, they, she didn't even have a 35 millimeter camera. She had like those 110 films. I don't know if any of you remember, but they're like the ones that look like, they're like long films and the cameras were like really thin. <laughs> they're very eighties anyway. Um, and yeah, like collecting photographs, photo albums, you know, and then going back to my mom's house and looking at her, at her own collection. I feel like the, I'm really interested also in like the, the term rascuache, which is, you know, we, we've been archiving way before, you know, we have, we have, we archive our own ways, you know, we, we were talking about shoe boxes with with photographs and letters you know this is the way we this is the way we we preserve our stuff <laughs> it might not be the best way but that's our style 
I really appreciate your response to that, um, Lupe, because I think you're also explaining something that is hard to articulate at times is that there's so much that doesn't exist within the canon of art history or a canon of you know, photography that is really important uh, um, to include and discuss in a history of documenting documenting the world and uh, and and the visual culture that is very you know personal and part of the lived experiences of so many people and um, it like having the opera I know you went to art school and having that kind of work function within the realm of you know in the context of museums and um, and galleries is one type of an operation but creating a bridge creating a kind of discourse that is that opens things up to include what would otherwise be called you know a vernacular kind of approach to image making and to photography is really important when we're thinking about inclusivity and also goes back to that question about whose stories get to be told and in what contexts exactly i liked hearing you describe um you know how you came to call this an archive and that your sort of recognition of it as an archive and I was wondering about that process like in kind of claiming that word when initially you weren't using it do you see that as a kind of um you know intervention or you're sort of staking staking a claim there to history I don't know I mean I feel like it's still changing you know I, th I think I changed my bio on the Tiranas like a, maybe two weeks ago you know, because it's like how we found the right description, you know, or is it always going to be evolving? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I think I'm open to that, you know, um, you know, even like when I, when I started these Instagrams, I was using a lot of hashtags. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now I, I figured out that the best way to tell a story is to actually tell a story you know, to engage with a community, to talk to the person that's submitting the photo and say, hey, what do you want to talk about? How do you want this? What, should, what memory do you want to share with us? Like, tell me what, tell me about this day. You know, like anyone can look at the last photograph that I posted, you know, and she tells this beautiful story of her getting ready uh, before going to take this photo where she got her, her buckle, you know, and and that is all valuable. So, yeah. That's like a mantra. The best way to tell a story is to tell mm -hmm. a story. Um, okay, another question from Nestor Guerrero. Um, how have sound soundscapes played a role in helping you tap back into these moments of the past? I've been following your page for a while and love whenever you share clips of Lanhard House and techno music. And it made me wonder how sound interacts with your visual archiving. Annie also says, thanks for your work. My TOs are in the party cruise. I showed them your pages and it opened up so many memories for them. I love hearing their stories. Oh, thank you so much. Um, music, music, sound is so powerful. You know, um, there were a lot of songs in particular oldies that really took me back and you know this there of course you know they they activate trauma too or even like sad memories you know but at the same time every time that I heard specific songs that reminded me of my cousin they were in some ways like like comforting you know and and it's really interesting how that works, right? How sound just like sticks with you. I mean, he died over 20 years ago and then it's like a like smell, right? Like a perfume. It takes you back to, to a time. And I think music is, is really powerful in that way. Whether it's oldies, hip hop, house music, you know. Um, I can still remember the first, the song that I heard the first time I saw, I was at a house party. You know, like I can still remember the kids dancing and break dancing, battling each other to a particular song, you know, so yeah, but I think music is really important in my work, you know, and I, 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 go ahead. Could you also talk about the phone booth piece, the sound piece at, the, at VPAM? We had an image of it, but we went by it really quickly. 
Yeah, so um, I had a, an installation <clears throat> of, a, of a payphone at the Vincent Price show. And that was pretty much like how you were welcome to the exhibition. And it was interactive in a way that the, uh, like the people can pick it up and there's a voicemail playing. And that voicemail was a recording of a young teenage girl giving you directions to a party or promoting a party. And that's how we used to do it. And there's also music playing in the background, you know? And I don't know um, if the people that are here are familiar with the way voicemails or party lines work, but we always had a song, like we had a, every, that we had to select a song for the vibe, for whatever mood we wanted to bring into the room, to the room, which meant like the party line over the phone, or if you were like working on your voicemail. Yeah, so that's what was playing in the uh, exhibition. Um, so Frank Miranda is asking, what do you think is missing from the archive of LA's youth culture among Chicanos, Latinos, et cetera? Um, how do you think you might contribute to filling that space? What do you think is needed to fill it and to start archiving today's Chicanos, Latinos, et cetera? To the archive as a whole, or like, you mean like, like in institutions? I think he means like the um, sort of contemporary, um, you know, what's, go what's happening now and um, what is needed to, to archive it and, and what, what is missing. I mean, that's a big question. But you know what, actually, I, I'm, I'm, I could tell you my experience with that. So when I started, when the, when the physical archive started growing, and this is, again, 2015 started uh, Veteranas and Rucas, I already, people were already donating materials. And I went to Chicano Studies UCLA and I pretty much went to, cause I was, I was seeking help, right? Like, so, like resources, I'm not like an archivist. Um, I'm also wondering if they have materials, materials similar to what I'm interested in. And it was a big no, like, no, we don't have 90s party crew. We don't have like kids hanging out in the 90s on Winter Bloom Heart. But they were really, well, let's, let's talk about this. You know, like, why don't we? And like, maybe like we can work together. So, you know, I'm, I have this material and they were like, well, you can house it here. The only problem is that if, if we house the archive, you have to give us all, all rights, like uh, ownership. And I really, I thought about that. Like, what does it mean for an institution to carry this archive? And what does it mean for this archive to live on the West side at UCLA? You know, so I feel like I'm learning that this archive or archives need to be almost like community, um, uh, maybe like where a community can like, can engage with, you know, maybe like a, an archive on the east side. Um, and I feel like maybe the other thing that I've learned is that a lot of people don't really know how to archive, you know, and that's something that I'm really interested in doing. Like hopefully in the future, I have a space where people can come with their own personal archives and learn how to, how to take care of their materials how to digitize their stuff. So that's my answer to that question. Thanks. <clears throat> um, okay, another question. Oh, we've got a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so uh, from Javier. Um, Hi Lupe, is your scribing considering the graffiti glass scribing one encounters across LA and public restrooms, bus windows, etc. cetera. Um, I'm thinking about the notion of spots, the sacred grounds worth claiming. So he's asking, is there oh, a relationship? What's the question? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, is there a relationship to that? Um, For sure. I mean, this is what I see right. everywhere. You know, uh, my I, I don't want to out him, but I will. My my brother in law still scribes all over. You know, like sometimes my sister gets annoyed at him. He's like, oh my god, like stop climbing that building. You know, <laughs> to like scribe your name on glass or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the same. You know. This, it's like, yeah, it's, it comes from different directions, I would say. Um, so another one is um, 
after showing your work in Mexico City, um, what was the Mexican audience's impression about the 19th underground youth scene in LA? Were there similarities in lived experiences or more differences from those in Mexico and those that are Chicano in the, in the US during that time? I wanna say that um, there's a huge disconnection you know, a lot of people in Mexico don't know how complex Chicano culture can be, like how, how complex it is, you know? It's like they know what they see. But the other thing is that people who went to see the show were different types of people, different backgrounds. You know, you had people who were really interested in a like artistic way but there were also people who were there who had been deported back to Mexico, who actually were raised in LA, who were part of the scene, who were deported back to Mexico and ha don't have access to coming back home. And like they have families in LA, they have families in the US. Um, I wanna say that my brother was one of the reasons why I did this, you know? My brother was also deported back. He and I talk about this, you know, he, he lives in Mexico and he tells me like, I know when I meet someone from LA, I know by the way they walk and the way they, they do, like they give me a handshake, you know? And I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know? So um, I think it was really important for the work to go to Mexico and to travel outside of the US because of that. Okay, one more question. Um... I'm sorry, I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but um, we'll save the chat so that you can um, see them, Guadalupe and, uh, and Pilar later. So, um, hi, I love your work. I'm an art student. This is from Atsi Perez. Um, I was wondering if it was a challenge reclaiming your space in the art world because, because of these archives. Has it been easy or hard trying to retell these stories to the public who are not familiar with the culture? Do people give the same reactions? Seeing these images and exhibits and books make me feel so powerful, considering how exclusive these art spaces are. Yeah, so um, I trend, especially, you know, like even, I don't, I don't know what my options are during COVID, you know, cause everything is, is closed, but it seems like things aren't gonna open up soon. But, um, you know, I, you know, I guess like in the last maybe three years, I've used exhibition space to make the archive available and accessible to the public rather than having it sit in my studio, rather than having it sit in an institution where not a lot of people feel comfortable going to, you know, or don't have access to. Um, and then on a personal level, you know, Going back to the exhibition I had at the Vincent Prize Museum, um, I work really closely with, with my sister and she has a 20 year old daughter. And it was really, I think it was really important for her to be part of this exhibition because it's not only empowering her, but it's also empowering her daughter, my niece. You know, So it's almost like I want my generation and future generations to feel empowered by these archives and also feel seen by it, by them, you know? Um, <clears throat> I also had this like wall, I guess, um, almost like a collage. How would you describe Pilar? Like this um, okay. wallpaper collage, right? Um, of women, different women socializing all over LA. And, um, the, you know, I, I, asked, I asked him if I could have them in the show, you know, like I was really like, this is my first show in LA. Um, it's gonna be like an, an ELAC and, it's, you know, so people were really excited to come to, these, to the space. And for the opening, I would say that the majority of the people that went to this exhibition were people that were part of these, these, um, these like, I guess like this part of the, the of subculture, I would call it, you know, who 
were taking pictures in front of themselves, you know, they were like pointing pictures like themselves at their kids, like, this is me. And my sister was doing the same thing, like, hey, that's that's me, you know, to her daughter. So that's not to say that it hasn't been challenging, you know, like, of course, it has been challenging. Um, some people, I think even uh, when I was doing the LACMA takeover, and I think it was like Art News who wanted to, someone like pitched this, this, this article, you know, this write up to Art News or Art Forum. And they're like, well, we don't know how to talk about it. We don't know how to talk about this archive, you know? And then like the following year, I had all these like, you know, I had Art News, I had Art Forum, I had LA Times, I had all these people writing about the work. And my friend who had pitched this story to Art News, she was like, see, I told them that like, there's a way to talk about it. You know, they just didn't really like, they couldn't wrap their minds around it. I, I remember the opening so well. I mean, there were more than 600 people that came um, to your opening at the at VPAM, which was really so amazing and so fun. And you had the lowrider um, groups in front of the museum as well. But um, one of the things that really struck me too is how many people came to the museum that had followed you on Instagram who didn't have the, uh, the cultural habit of going to art museums. And so I remember noticing that there were a lot of people who as you said, came, you know, that are in the photographs, came with their families, wanted to show their children. I remember that specifically a lot of people, you know, feeling a lot of pride that day, a lot of pride and also um, a lot of empowerment. And, um, and, and it was also striking to see like people arrive and then like, now we're not, now what do we do? Like, what are you to do was the question people kept asking me, like, there's the people who I said, what do we do here? I was like, you're doing it, you're, you're doing it, you're here, you know? <laughs> so that was also kind of such an interesting and like telling thing was people thought, I don't know, they just thought like there were something specific that had to happen once they arrived or, and I, I was really excited that we were able to in, invite new types of publics into a museum setting that didn't have that, uh, didn't necessarily have a lot of those experiences and say this, you know, this is here to just like live in the moment and look at imagery and be connected to each other and be in community with each other. It was really special. Well, unfortunately we're out of time. There were a ton of questions we didn't get to. So sorry, everyone that didn't get there comments and questions read out or answered. I wanted to say one last thing um, from Raul Garcia, because it's super beautiful. And he says, thank you Guadalupe for representing our people and the sacred stories, representing our community and humanizing marginalized people. So I just want to end by thanking both of you so much. Um, we really appreciate you being here and, and learning more about your work. So. We hope there'll be more. Um, someone in the chat did ask for more and when you're gonna be back for another Zoom, so. <laughs> All right. Um, night, I would everybody. mention that um, people can also email me. Uh, I don't know if we should just share the email or what, but um, it's East LA 1980, it's very simple, East LA. So if you guys didn't get your answer, your questions answered, just email me and I'm more than happy to talk to you. And again, thank you so much for everyone here. Uh, thank you, Pilar. Thank you, the Getty, Zana, everyone. Thanks. That's East LA 1980 at Gmail? Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you got it now, everyone. All right. Thank you so much.